So good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this roundtable discussion at an early hour and after the music night. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. Um, so um, this um, roundtable discussion today will be on um, inclusion and legitimacy in multi-stakeholder internet governance model, and uh, we'll be discussing um, ICANN as an example. Um, inclusion is a cornerstone uh, of legitimacy for multi-stakeholder approaches to internet governance. And one of the key arguments for supporting multi-stakeholder models is being equally inclusive to stakeholders from all sectors, regions, genders, languages, races, age groups, and etc. But how does this inclusive diversity work in practice? Does multi-stakeholder governance of uh, internet provide everyone with due opportunities to participate? What is the impact of this on effectiveness and fairness of the decision-making process? Um, all uh, are valid questions uh, that we uh, need to discuss. And today we'll be discussing uh, the Internet uh, Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers as an example. Um, ICANN is one of the main pioneers and champions of multi-stakeholderism in internet governance, um, in multi -stakeholder, of multi-stakeholderism, I'm sorry, in internet governance, and uh, moreover, um, uh, ICANN has concerted uh, many initiatives to promote inclusive uh, participation in the governance of global internet infrastructure. Um, so, what is the situation regarding inclusion uh, at ICANN today? How is ICANN addressing inclusiveness uh, and access in its bottom-up multi-stakeholder model? And how successful are those initiatives in practice? All these questions will be guiding uh, us in our discussion today. And um, today we have with us um, uh, Jan Scholte, Professor of uh, Peace and Development at University of Gutenberg and Co-Director uh, of the Center for Global Cor Corporation uh, Research at the University of uh, Duisburg-Essen. Uh, Jan is Principal Investigator in, I in the ICANN Legitimacy Study, which will be the subject of uh, our uh, discussion today. Uh, we also have with us um, Horten Sionen, uh, a researcher at the University of Gutenberg and part of Jan's team uh, working uh, on ICANN study as well. Um, so Jan and his team have uh, randomly selected more than 450 uh, participants uh, across ICANN from board, community and staff for a survey uh, interview. Uh, to get uh, most precise and reliable information on uh, basically three things. How do ICANN participants view the issue of inclusive participation and its uh, relation to ICANN legitimacy? How far do they perceive structural inequalities of influence in relation to geographical, sectoral and social uh, categories? and uh, whether they regard any such inequalities and uh, exclusions to be problematic for internet governance through ICANN. Um, so before handing over the floor to Jan to give us an overview of the report and its findings, allow me also to uh, introduce our speakers and discussants today um, and the format of the session. So we have four distinguished speakers with I'm sorry, three speakers with us. We have um, Nandini Chaimi uh, on my right. And uh, Nandini is Deputy Director of IT for Change, 
uh, Nandini's work largely focuses on uh, research and policy advocacy in the domains of uh, digital rights and development and the political economy of women's rights in the information society. So, welcome Nandini. Um, we also have with us Erika Mann, uh, sitting to my left. She is a senior European policy advisor in uh, Covington's EU uh, public policy practice group and a former member of the European Parliament. She is also a member of ICANN's GNSO Council and a former member of ICANN's Board of Directors. Um, Erika also um, opened the and, and headed the Facebook office in Brussels from 2011 to 2016. Um, and last but definitely not least, we also have uh, Leon Sanchez. Uh, Leon started as an ICANN Fellow and is now um, ICANN Board Director, but also the Vice Chair of the Board. He is a lawyer and head of the Intellectual Property Division and partner at uh, Fulton & Fulton, a law firm in Mexico. He is involved in um, ISOC Mexico and serves on the boards of Trustnet Corporate Group, ISDI Mexico, as well as several other non-profit organizations in, in Mexico. So we will be starting with um, a presentation from Jan on the report and the findings of the report. Um, then we will have two rounds of discussions uh, we will hear from our speakers their remarks on the report and then open the floor for uh, any comments or remarks. And then we'll give back the floor to our distinguished speakers for uh, further comments and any suggestions for uh, future proposals. And then back to the floor again to hear uh, your remarks and if you have further suggestions. So with this, and without further ado, I hand over to you, Jan, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Manal. Uh, thank you, Nandini, Erika, Leon, for participating and speaking. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you also, remote participants. Are we okay for the remote participants? I hope they're, 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 they're here as well. Um, and thank you, those of you around the table. I'm not allowed to acknowledge you because the study was anonymous uh, and confidential, but a number of you I recognize as people that, uh, that, that spoke with us. And uh, if you had not helped us, then this study would not have happened. So I'm glad we have a chance to share what came out uh, in this sense. We're talking about the inclusion aspect here. In fact, as you know, the, the study is about legitimacy at ICANN and we looked at inequalities as an aspect of legitimacy at ICANN. But then we saw that the IGF was having a special stream on inclusion, and we thought, ah, actually we have some interesting data that could be shared here. So we're not actually going to be making the connections with legitimacy perceptions today, but we are look, going to look at the perceptions that people have of inequalities of influence at ICANN and multi-stakeholderism, and whether they matter. So these are our two questions. In what ways and to what extents do participants in the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, perceive inequalities of influence in the regime? So we're looking at perceptions. We're not looking at objective indicators. We're seeing what do people see. And uh, how far do participants perceive any such inequalities to be problematic? Because you might perceive inequalities but not actually find them problematic. So we also are asking people whether they find it problematic for the regime. Um, why are these questions interesting? Well, structural inequalities in very, in very general terms are debated much as, uh, uh, in, in contemporary society. Um, and perceptions of problematic inequalities can be major drivers for political debate and regime change. Also, when we look at inequalities in governance, inequalities in governance might actually help or serve to produce rules which generate or sustain inequalities in society more generally. In internet governance, uh, structural inequalities in the internet, so-called digital divides, uh, can deeply affect the life chances of people in a digital society, so inequalities are important in that way. Um, and then in multi-stakeholderism multi and ICANN, I mean, multi-stakeholderism promotes itself 
as being a way to get all affected people involved in decision taking and policy making. Uh, and I can, as a major site of multi-stakeholderism and multi-stakeholder governance, has greatly promoted inclusive decision taking. Many, many initiatives over quite a few years to include people from all regions, from all genders, from multiple languages, uh, uh, all generations, and so on. So it's interesting to ask now, in 2018, 2019, when we did these uh, interviews, uh, how far do participants in the regime perceive inequalities of influence and do they find that they matter? So that's what we're going to show you. Uh, very quickly, we sampled. This is a, we did a random sample. We did a fairly rigorous random sample. Hortense is sitting next to me, is, is the one who does all the technical stuff and, and is quite confident that we have a random sample so that what we tell you here is representative. It should be representative, quite close, within you know, several percentage points of, uh, of, of statistical uh, reliability to what the general situation uh, in the ICANN sphere is. Uh, we interviewed th all 30 members of the ICANN board between 2015 and 2018. Uh, we interviewed 305 members of the ICANN community spread across different regions, uh, sectors and so on. Uh, we interviewed 132 members of staff and we weighted these, uh, the, the results that you see. So there's a disproportionate number. We wanted to have census samples as they call it from board, community and staff. It means that the numbers were slightly uneven and so we've uh, weighted them in the statistics that you'll see here. Okay, let's start with uh, results. Uh, we asked people in principle, how important do you find it that ICANN gives all stakeholders opportunities to participate? And here you can see, vast majority of people thought it was extremely important. So the principle of inclusive policy making, is, there's a pretty good consensus around it that that is important and should matter. So it's quite important or very important, and in fact, not so many people fall below that. Uh, then about ICANN's performance, in practice, to what extent do you think ICANN gives all stakeholders the opportunity to participate? So in practice, the first one was in principle, this is in practice, again the scores come out quite high. Uh, so to a large extent, is the, is the high bars in the, in the middle there, a little bit to the right, uh, completely is the, is the, is the, the, the bunch to the, to, the, to the further right, moderately is the chunk in the middle, and then not so many people saying that, it, that not much happened. So, the record on inclusive participation by different stakeholders in ICANN is regarded as being relatively strong by participants in the ICANN regime. But, if you ask, are there inequalities of influence within that participation, then people also see that there are inequalities of participation. And here this graph shows you from left to right uh, five dimensions of inequality. The middle line four, if the lines had fallen at, at four in the middle, then it would have been a perception of equal influence. But you will see that in each case the line comes below the four uh, to show perceived inequality of influence on average. So by age, some inequality perceived, um, then one goes further to uh, ethnicity, race, uh, language, uh, north-south, gender. Again, so uh, widely seen inequalities of influence, but then again, do they, are they regarded as problematic? Because you might say, okay, there are inequalities of one thing or another, and then you say, well, actually, it's not that important for the regime. So it's one thing to perceive inequalities of influence, it's another thing to find them problematic. Here are the results for, for perceiving them as problematic, and then you see that age inequalities are seen as relatively less problematic, uh, somewhere just below the moderately, so uh, above a, a bit problematic, but not quite at moderately problematic. The other four inequalities, by race, ethnicity, by uh, uh, language, by region, and by gender, are seen as progressively more problematic, somewhere between moderately problematic and quite problematic. Interesting thing, if you look here, the gender inequalities were perceived to be, the, the, the inequalities of influence by gender were perceived to be the least out of the five, but they are also regarded as being the most problematic. 
That's kind of interesting. Now let's look at what people say about inequalities and their problematicness depending on who they are. So within these different groups, you can, you can ask, do they perceive these inequalities differently? Now on average, Global South participants and Global North participants perceive the same amount of North-South inequality. It's no different. So that's interesting. And on average, participants with lower English skills and higher English skills perceive broadly the same amount of inequality of influence. So on those two dimensions, not much difference. Doesn't matter who you are, you see the same average degree of inequality of influence. But non-white participants perceive significantly more race ethnic inequality in ICANN than white participants. So on the race ethnicity dimension, there's actually quite a different perception and experience of the situation. And on average, younger generations perceive a greater, significantly greater age inequality than the older generations. So everyone's seeing an inequality, but the younger people are seeing a greater inequality than the older generations. And on average, women perceive significantly more gender inequality at ICANN than men. And this is actually in order, so the biggest gap is actually the gender gap. So, people are seeing the different inequalities. Do they see the situations differently when it comes to whether it's problematic or not? Well, on average, non-white participants perceive race ethnic inequality at ICANN to be somewhat more problematic than white persons, but it's not statistically significant. But we do see that younger participants perceive age inequality at ICANN to be somewhat more problematic, and this one is statistically significant. Again, we're going in order. So the age perception of problematicness is also statistically significant. But then we move on again. On average, Global South participants perceive North-South inequalities at ICANN to be significantly more problematic than Global North participants. So everyone sees, both participants from North and South, see the same amount of inequality of influence on average, but the Global South participants find this inequality to be far more problematic than the Global North participants. And likewise, when we look at participants with lower English skills, they are perceiving that language inequalities are more problematic than those who have the English skills. Again, this might be intuitively what you expect, but it's interesting to, to, to pin it down and to see that actually quite significant different perceptions. So, an English speaker might be in this situation and a non-English speaker, the English speaker thinks, oh yes, there is an inequality of influence there, but they, they underestimate the amount of, of degree to which this is problematic for the non-English speaker. Uh, and then the greatest, the greatest gap in perceptions is the gender one. So women participants perceive gender inequality at ICANN to be significantly more problematic than men. And here we're talking about it's a, it's a, it's a four-point scale and the difference of average perception is, is not 0.7. So that's, that's quite whopping actually. So in summary, participants uh, broadly appreciate ICANN's efforts to, reach, uh, to achieve uh, stakeholder involvement in policy making, but participants do perceive substantial inequalities of influence at ICANN uh, on lines of age, gender, geography, language, race, ethnicity, and sector. Actually, that's some additional evidence that we didn't present here. But um, part and participants perceive these inequalities of influence to be between moderately and quite problematic for the regime. And as we've shown, in general, those in the more subordinate position of these hierarchies of influence tend to find these inequalities to be more problematic than those in the more dominant positions. Okay, now to anticipate a few qualifications that we might want to make, we are here only looking at perceptions of inequalities. We're only looking at what people see. We're not looking at, the, at sort of hard data about how many people are occupying chairs and that sort of thing. That kind of evidence you would look, want to uh, uh, supplement to this that we've presented here. We've just looked at the perceptions. Um, we have not established here the significance of these perceptions of inequality for the legitimacy of ICANN. So, we don't know yet, because we haven't done that part of the analysis, but you might perceive inequalities, you might perceive them to be problematic, it doesn't necessarily follow that you have less confidence in the regime. It may, 
but it doesn't necessarily follow. Um, and we should also note, we have survey participants from the ICANN regime here only. One might presume, again, we'd have to test it, but one might presume that people who are not participating on, in ICANN might on average perceive larger inequalities. Indeed, it might even be a reason why they don't participate. So with those qualifications, I hand, hand over to the speakers and thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you for the presentation, but also thank you, uh, you and Hortens for the, for the survey itself and for the study and for the interesting uh, findings. Um, actually, I find it very interesting when both sides see the problem, but one part see it significant, one part not. I mean, when there is agreement, there would be easier solutions. When there is not the same perceptions, um, this may make things a little bit more difficult. But uh, let's see how um, our speakers uh, regard the findings and who would like to start? Nandini, would you? Okay. Thank you, Professor Yan. And I'll structure my comments, uh, you know, according to reflections on the report, as that is what we were asked to do when making the set of interventions. So first of all, I want to say that this report is very important because it reaffirms this understanding that openness is not necessarily equivalent to an environment for inclusive participation. And this is something that even other research into free culture and force communities and tech communities informed by this ethos have shown us, such as uh, Joseph Riegel's very famous work on Wikipedia communities. And it's also interesting to quote from the study that the people who are at the subordinate ends of structural inequalities of influence in ICANN find these hierarchies more problematic. And I think this is a very important consideration that we must take away when we look at like designing environments for meaningful and inclusive participation because a general exhortation for being open and diverse in general, that is actually very alienating for people from certain marginal locations. Because when there is an ethos where it's up to you to participate and the environment is positioned as a neutral and open, then it's very easy to look at non-participation as a matter of individual choice or preference, but there may be structural dynamics in the interactions which alienate people of color or women or non-English speakers, and this is a very important finding, I think. The other thing I want to call attention to is something that surprised me in the study. So uh, the study's findings said that many respondents did feel that the business sector has a strong influence on ICANN decisions, but at the same time, they also did not find this particularly problematic. I know the studies, uh, the survey was conducted between 2016 and uh, 2018, but in the light of subsequent developments, I'm particularly speaking about the decision to allow the increase of price caps on the .org domain. I found this decision very surprising because in this context, actually there were 3,000 parties who wrote opposing the removal of price caps and there were hardly six comments that supported the change. But in the final decision, when the price caps were uh, allowed to be removed, the summary from ICANN actually said that there was a group that opposed lifting price caps, but it is not true that the community was strongly opposed to lifting them. So there are 3,000 comments on one side and about six to seven comments on the other side. So when these come together and certain decisions take place, we also have to look at accountability in this decision making and we may need to rethink these processes in open decision making. And my final comment is that when we look at directions for future research, I think we must build from Professor Yan's summary point that perceptions are important 
particularly in suggesting from where the greatest pressure for change might come, but they are not the only measure of the issue. This is because power operates at multiple levels and we may have to bring different methods to analyze what are the different dimensions of power at work which actually lead to certain decisions. Like for example, take the issue and the whole controversy around jurisdictional immunity, right? It might be good to also inform the study by speaking about why in that a particular controversy there was a certain majoritarian opinion and who was in the minority and who was dissenting and how you could see geopolitics at operation there. So I think we need to also talk about power in the macro level in the analysis along with looking at micro power in personalized interactions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nandini, for your uh, valuable remarks on um, different aspects. We'll get back to them uh, later, but allow me to also ask Erika what would you uh, see regarding the findings and whether you have any, anything specific that strikes you in the findings. Thank you so much, Manal. Um, and thank you so much for, the, um, for this great uh, study and uh, report. Um, what I like to do, I like to focus on maybe three more general uh, areas, which I believe relate to the topic we are discussing. So I want to broaden the scope a little bit. So the first is the importance of the multi-stakeholder model and re related to the second topic, which are the weaknesses. And in, in relation to the topic we are debating of fairness and inclusiveness, I believe there's one item we need to keep in mind, and that's the history. So once you create an organization like when ICANN was created, it has a particular mission, a particular goal, it's relatively narrow in scope, and because of the history, of course, you have much more uh, technical and business understanding. That's the way it was shaped, and automatically, part of the uh, non-inclusiveness comes from the, from the history. Because if you have an organization like this, which was created uh, primarily, um, not only, but the, the beginning, much of the debate, how it was shaped, um, US and, and to some degree EU-centric based, of course, it has, the history will never fade away. So it takes an immense long of time to overcome the, 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 these kind of uh, barriers. That's true for gender issues too, because when you look back in the history, of course there were many women, women involved, but like it is often the case in, in institutional framing, um, these kind of participants are often in, 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 the, you know, in the future overlooked because men like to glorify themselves and, and women often don't do this. So that's a, a role we have to play actively to, you know, to uh, bring the women which are part of this uh, from the very beginning, you know, to bring them in center. Um, so that's one issue which we, I believe we have to work on. The second we have to work on is what I call the weaknesses. So because of the model is very narrow, uh, I can, and it should be narrow because it's only one part of the internet ecosystem. It's not the internet. We sometimes believe it's the internet, but it's not the internet, it's part of it. But that's it. But because of this, um, there are, of course, issues which are more focusing on, on let's say, on the, on the market driver, which are, you know, the, the domain system, which are located, uh, when, you, when you look at it, and, and the data, which are lo primi primarily located in certain locations around the globe. So some of the, the unfairness or the which we experience, again, relates back to the dominance in certain markets, and we shouldn't forget this. And then because of this, we experience, um, you know, the disfavoring of certain regions, um, but it's a market reality. Um, we, we can't overlook it, it's part of a market reality. And uh, again, it relates to some degree, of course, to the proportion how women participate as well because in these market segments you have traditionally more men still than you have women. So you, we have to review this in, if we are debating uh, about this topic. And the last item I believe which is, um, is important 
um, what we typically tend to ignore, although we have ALAC and we have a, we try to shape the consumer and the user environment, but we have very poor understanding about it. We have super poor understanding about the market, we have super poor understanding about the domain environment, and we have super poor understanding about consumers and users. Why am I saying this? Because in particular, on the, on the users and, and the consumers, they are, of course, across the globe. Um, and um, there you have a much broader uh, fair share between women and men, but we don't surface them because we have a very poor understanding um, in the ICANN environment. So, these are my points. Thank you so much, Manna. Thank you very much, Erika. So, um, over to you, Leon, please, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Thank you very much, Manna. Thank you, uh, uh, Jan, for conducting this study of tents. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I, I, I think the results of the study seem uh, very intuitive, right? It it's, it's, uh, seems obvious that those who feel that don't have the uh, influence they wish they had feel like there's this disparity and, 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 and they, they feel uh, aggravated about uh, 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 the lack of maybe inclusiveness or the meaningfulness in their participation. Uh, however, I think it's good that we have these results materialized so that they can be applied for us to actually set the bar and, 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 and identify the room that we have for improvement. So uh, I think that despite the efforts, there is actually room for improvement. But we can also not deny reality, right? I mean, not everyone is able to devote the time needed for meaningfully participating in ICANN. Uh, not everyone speaks English, not everyone has the resources of the connectivity to join uh, remotely a meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yes, these are things that affect participation within ICANN, and not only within ICANN, but in other fora. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and this also draws a line between what I believe is the difference between inclusive and meaningful participation, right? As, as, as you were saying, uh, uh, we've seen this in the uh, open software, free software community, the open culture community. So, so the fact that it's open doesn't actually entail or comprise that your participation is either guaranteed or that it's meaningful. Uh, within these uh, groups, you also find uh, a notion which I think those who have been in ICANN are familiar with, which are the silos, right? So people get to, to gather around common interests and they, they, turn, they tend to form uh, groups. And these groups sometimes are uh, resistant to change and they are also resistant to new actors. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to find your way within, within a community that has been around for quite some time and they know each other very well and you are the new guy somehow and come in and people will have expectations about what is your agenda, what is your purpose of being there, do you actually come here to contribute meaningfully, are you constructively or willing to, to, uh, to contribute in a constructive way or are you just someone that is there to see how you make uh, people's life impossible, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there, there are a number of aspects that can uh, uh, influence or, or actually define how you find your way within, within ICANN. Uh, there's been some comments about business sector dominance. I've also hear a number of uh, comments about governmental dominance. Uh, it feels like maybe the end users could be the sandwich in this. Uh, I also have heard some comments about uh, the technical community being outliers because they might not be engaged anymore. They, they uh, might feel that uh, they have other things to do. So, so I, I, again, it, it depends on uh, uh, the lens through which you are looking at this, right? So businesses sometimes think that governments dominate Governments say, oh no, it's the business sector that dominates. So this is what multi-stakeholderism is, right? We're not gonna have everyone agree and we're not gonna have everyone happy 
in this environment. Some define uh, multi-stakeholderism as uh, the art of uh, keeping everyone equally uh, e equally uh, uh, unhappy. unhappy, yes, right? I, 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 I don't think that's the, uh, the way I see it. I think that uh, it's, it's a way of finding compromise. And yes, you have to, it's, it's a give and take, a constantly uh, given and taken and, 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 and being flexible and trying to find common grounds and trying to actually set yourself in, in the, in, you know, in, in, in the, in the, in the shoes of, of your counterpart and trying to understand and trying to say, okay, why, why is my counterpart seeing this the way he or she sees it? So the, the, the study says that ICANN is a big experiment in terms of multi-stakeholderism and I, and I do believe it is. And I think it's uh, set uh, a lot of uh, examples and standards that can be followed not only within I can on how things could be done, but also on how things shouldn't be done. So it's 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 a two-way avenue, and I I I, I would like to reiterate that uh, I think that the system works. It of course needs improvement, but this is not something we're gonna perceive in the short term. So this is something that that needs to be taken care of jointly with all stakeholders across regions, across groups of interests, uh, across uh, people of uh, the different social backgrounds that come into ICANN or that are, are interested in, in, in joining ICANN. Uh, and, and I see it as an education and as, a, as, an, uh, and as a resource availability issue that is not solely to ICANN to resolve, right? So this is why all the stakeholders that participate within ICANN should be doing actions within their reach and within their uh, groups of interest and influence to pull in new people and to try to level up, uh, to, to try to level the ground for everyone to meaningfully and inclusively uh, participate. So uh, with that, I would go back to Manal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leon, and um, thanks to all three speakers for um, some excellent points. So, uh, Nandini, you highlighted uh, that um, openness is not necessarily inclusiveness, um, and also um, the what came out as a business sector being more influential, um, and that perceptions are important, but not the only measure. Um, and, and Erica, you talked about the importance of multi-stakeholder model, the weaknesses um, of the model, and poor understanding of user and consumer uh, environment. And, and finally, uh, Lyon, on the, uh, the, the, the results seem to be right, things affecting participation uh, at ICANN and other fora as well, uh, silos within the multi-stakeholder model. And, and the perception of domination of, of uh, certain stakeholder groups. Um, so um, I'll stop here and open the floor for any other um, remarks uh, on the findings from uh, the audience, whether out of experience within ICANN or even other uh, multi-stakeholder fora. So, uh, the discussion is open. We're taking ICANN as an example, but please feel free if you have uh, experience uh, elsewhere. And I, I seem to know everyone, but it will be good to introduce yourself. So I have Sebastian and, and then Jorge. Yeah. Sebastian, please. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian Bachelet. Um, currently, uh, within ICANN, uh, newly elected chair of uh, Euralo, the part of end users within ICANN uh, in the European region. Uh, thank you, Jan, for this uh, study. I think it's a very important piece of work because uh, um, after the work done for IANA transition, stewardship IANA transition, um, you, you were participating to this and I guess it's uh, coming from the discussion we have in those groups that uh, this study is, uh, is coming from. And uh, I think it's a, a good image. I, I would like to urge us to uh, uh, do some uh, data analysis on, uh, and on historical data analysis of this, uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, 
uh, elements because uh, the composition of the leadership team in different parts of uh, ICANN could be a good uh, uh, subject to study how it has evolved and uh, how it could be evolved. The second point is that what we can do, and uh, that's good to have an uh, element of uh, information, but uh, what we can do and who could be in charge of changing that. Uh, when uh, in Workstream 2 we suggest to have a, a diversity uh, a board or a diversity uh, 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 function to take care of that, uh, it was dismissed. And, um, and my last point is that sometimes the one who could uh, be the more strongest voice for something are the one who uh, struggle against. And, um, and today, I guess, gender balance could be achieved within ICANN, but the one more vocal not to do anything are some women. And I am sorry to say that, but I heard that because they, the answer is, oh, skill is more important. And my motto is, skill you, st you can learn. The rest, it's the diversity you can bring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Jorge, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, Jorge Cancio from the Swiss government. I happen also to represent Switzerland in, within the GAC, the Governmental Advisory Committee. Um, first of all, uh, thanks very much for this study. I think it gives us uh, uh, useful data. And uh, as always with studies and data, uh, it will depend very much on the perspective uh, on how you read it or what you want to read in, uh, in that study. But I think uh, at least it's, it's a good basis. It's a common uh, ground on uh, where we can base more, more fact-based uh, discussions. Uh, I think that uh, in the discussion it was pointed to the issue of uh, open working groups. Really in ICANN, we, di we do policy in uh, the so-called uh, policy development, uh, development processes with open working groups, uh, open to anyone. Uh, but uh, as was pointed out, uh, open does not mean that uh, meaningful participation, that, <laughs> oh, it's so that meaningful participation is possible. So there's open as a precondition, but it's far from being enough to make it possible that we have uh, participation from uh, all the stakeholder groups uh, in a balanced fashion. There are some, some discussions ongoing, the so-called PDP 3.0. This is a GNSO effort, so the, from that sub-organization of ICANN which uh, prepares the policy on uh, generic top-level do domains. But uh, I think that we are still very much in, uh, in the mindset of those uh, original and historically uh, uh, determined uh, open working group where uh, technicians uh, used to be uh, the peers who, uh, who participated there and everyone uh, in that community recognized themselves as equals. Normally it was Western white men with a technical background. But today ICANN is a completely different uh, animal. And the policies we do are um, mostly not really technical. There's a lot of policy, politics also. In, in that, so uh, really communities, individual users, governments have a stake there. And uh, as one of the government representatives who has participated in, uh, I think, a lot of PDPs and of uh, cross-community working groups, which is a similar thing uh, in the ICANN world, um, when you look around in the call or in the, at the table and you look at who is speaking and who is there, there are very few governments. There is uh, almost uh, 
In no case you have really people from the global south, or very few of them, and when it comes to speaking, they don't speak. There are uh, some exceptions, but those are individuals who, who by some uh, constellation have that possibility. So I think we really have to address this, uh, not hide from it, because it's important to, to go really into uh, the direction of meaningful participation and uh, the open working group uh, model of doing policy is a problem. So we really have to tackle that and uh, make sure that uh, there are additional layers of participation which are not only shambles, which are not only for the show, but which are really uh, there to make inputs happen. And uh, this goes beyond also ICANN. The, uh, I had a discussion with uh, another policy network a couple of days ago, and we have the same problems there because we're trying to uh, develop some multi-stakeholder policy in that forum. But in the end, you end up with many Western, uh, very well-educated colleagues, mostly men, although the gender gap is diminishing, but uh, you miss all the people from the global south because this model of having thousands of emails and teleconferences where you take decisions with discussions in English is not inclusive. It doesn't work. It is uh, possibly a precondition, it's one element, but we have to build on that, but really uh, addressing uh, the, the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. I have the gentleman here and then Lucebis and Martin. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Paul Rowney. I'm from the Global South. <laughs> um, my, 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 my comments on this is, and I'm, I'm on the MAG with the IGF, so I'm with a different multi-stakeholder group. And, you know, the, the, these issues flow through most of these, these sort of groups. Inclusion is an issue. Multi-stakeholder is an issue. It's, it's complex to get that balance. Uh, we do need to avoid token participation to achieve uh, inclusion. We need to ensure that the environment is conducive to encourage equitable participation. And we, we need environments that understand and respect diverse cultures because we, we engage differently. People from the global north, you know, can be quite more aggressive in the way that they engage to the global south. Uh, we, we also have issues in, in the big organizations where the so-called experts, you know, the ones that have benefited by being there from time, they've learned, they entrench themselves in these organizations. And for newcomers, they can be quite intimidating. And they, they tend to build networks that can exclude people internally, which doesn't help when you've got new entrants that are not so confident. You know, we need to build that confidence and that knowledge. And I'm happy to see our colleague here, you know, started as a fellow and has moved up. And, and we need to encourage a lot more of that from the global south. Uh, we should not force inclusion. Uh, we, need to, we do need to understand its root cause and we need to fix those root cause because inclusion should be natural. It shouldn't be forced. It shouldn't be artificial. So if it's not natural, you know, why, why is it not natural? You know, what are the causes? What is preventing people coming in? And my colleague here, you know, making the comment that people from the Global South, they're often present but don't voice themselves. And that, that's because it is intimidating <laughs> to come in a room and often that room is either gender unbalanced or it's, it's uh, ethnically unbalanced. And then you've got this group of claimed experts and you need to talk. <laughs> it's not easy for everybody to, to, to have that confidence. Uh, within, within ICANN, I, I think ICANN needs to understand what full inclusivity will mean for it. Uh, I would see it affecting change within the organization and I would hope to see a positive change in its culture and a change and an effective change in its interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I have uh, Lusavis and then Martin. Lusavis, please. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Luzuis van der Laan. Um, a former ICANN board member and, like Erica, former MEP, so I'm uh, very interested in how we can make policy decisions, especially that affect something of interest to citizens around the world, and how to do that in an inclusive and legitimate way. So I think this is a very good session, very timely session, and uh, I really want to compliment Jan and Hortense on the work they're doing, and I think it's a really important step in trying to figure out not only what legitimacy means that I can, but whether it can be a model for others. Because I think at the end of the day, we also need to compare this system and the IGF system with normal systems of making uh, uh, decisions at global level. If I look at decision making in the United Nations, which is exclusively the reserve of governments, and a lot of these governments don't have inclusive um, uh, uh, systems inside their own country, they don't have serious parliaments, they don't have uh, free media holding them to account, and I'm like, well, okay, maybe ICANN and IGF are not great, but uh, the alternatives can uh, actually be worse. So I think uh, that's not an excuse to, to not make sure we're very, very good, but I'd like to turn it around and say, let's see if we can make this work even better and then uh, be a serious competition for the intergovernmental uh, system of, of doing business. Um, then I, I remember, Jan, uh, I think it was in Panama on a roof somewhere that we were talking about where legitimacy comes from. And, uh, uh, and you said there's different ways of going about it, namely some people say that if the process was open and inclusive, then that grounds legitimacy. And others say, but no, if the outcome uh, is, uh, works like the internet works, so therefore, by definition, the system that runs it is. So I, I was wondering if, if at some point you're going to come back to that uh, in this study uh, and whether, because I don't remember the questions exactly, uh, where, how that could be reflected, because I think that's an interesting one, and, and that makes me wonder, because you raised the issue uh, of dot, dot .org, um, whether if you would have the question now, <laughs> whether there would be other, you know, whether this would be a point of concern that would come out. Um, I, I, I very much want to echo what Jorge said about some things being necessary but not sufficient conditions. I came to Aachen from the outside, but I had the privilege of immediately joining the board, so you get this incredible uh, support system around you, which is different, I think, than if you come from the outside and you have to really work your way, uh, way in. I don't think it's impossible for outsiders to, um, uh, to become part of, um, uh, of the whole system, but the biggest constraint that I see is simply time. Because if you're not being paid, or if your organization doesn't want you to be here, then uh, who has the time, and if you're not being funded, uh, and thus the money, so the resource constraint, to actually do all of this? I mean, one of the great pleasures of not being on the ICANN board anymore is not being drowning in this email uh, waterfall every single day. And, uh, and I think the, that, that is something that needs to be looked at, whether uh, it can't be done. Also, with all due respect, I think emails are very 1998. So I'm wondering if there's not a, a better way to, to do this that, that is going to be more efficient and, and more inclusive. Um, and then uh, I have one more question for Jan and Hortense, which is that I, I saw on one of the bar thingies uh, that, that sometimes the perception were different depending on which group w which was asked. And I'd be interested to know whether the board on a regular basis saw things differently than the community. Because I think the, the board has, I saw that in one or two of the, of, the, of the charts, because it would be interesting to see if the board sees less problems than the community does, because that could also indicate a, a, a level of disconnect between, in the perception between what the board sees and, uh, and what the community sees. So that was my question, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lusavis, for the remarks, but also the question. I, I think we'll, we'll be hearing a response later. So I, I have Martin. I, I'll then get back to the speakers, and then we'll have another. Okay. I have two more interventions, then the speakers, and then back to the floor again. So Martin, please. Thank you, Manal. And uh, I'm sorry, there's a sheer dominance of uh, former and current board members uh, sp taking the microphone. I'm a current one. Um, a focus is uh, for me on, on uh, so how do we get this multi-stakeholder system to work in a, in a way that we recognize as legitimate, but also effective. Um, I think that uh, there have been some examples of where things are not working as good as they should or, or, or whatever. 
I think over the years what we've seen is that uh, there's been a lot of search for how do we improve this and a lot of effort in making it better. And uh, coming from a tradition where you need me to face to, to face to get things done, that's also a tradition that we need to leave behind at some moment, I guess, uh, because we cannot uh, fly everybody who may want to say anything into every place in the world to have every, uh, participate to every conversation. That would kill the world because CO2 would go through the roof uh, and it would be unaffordable. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to enable participation and uh, in different multi-stakeholder networks we do it in different ways. Uh, in ICANN we try to actively uh, stimulate new people. We are having workshops around the world. Um, um, and for these workshops, uh, uh, these conferences, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on also creating a safe, supporting, welcoming environment so people that do come uh, can count on uh, it being a, an environment where they feel safe to express, to ask questions, uh, where they can even be informed if you, as newcomer, how do I participate to this specific multi-stakeholder network. Um, and more and more I see, not only in ICOM, but also in other multi-stakeholder networks, the importance and the growth of online uh, meetings as, uh, as an addition to uh, the way to uh, participate. Uh, I think one of the best things I saw is with IGF, basically, where uh, the regional events have become as important or even more important than the global annual event itself. And uh, maybe that distributed way of talking where things are discussed in regions where people are and brought back to central uh, is, is one of the ways forward. Uh, inclusive processes are a good start. Um, uh, as uh, Jorge said, we have a, a lot of good procedure, pr processes, etc. But in the end, it's all about what people do with it. And I think that's something that will change over time. Learning, seeking, actively being committed to finding better ways and to people being uh, open to other ways of participating. So uh, suggestions for improvement are so welcome and they are triggered by uh, this study as well. So I uh, want to thank Jan for that as well. Thank you, Martin, and we'll be discussing suggestions for improvement, but after the last intervention, so please go ahead. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Susan Payne. I participate in, in ICANN within the GNSO. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the, the perceptions on gender, and I'm, I'm not trying to discount them in any way, but, but you know, within a number of, of groups within ICANN, there are um, women in, in very senior positions, so we have you know, the chair of the IPC is a woman, the chair of the BC is a woman, the chair of the NCSG is a woman, the chair of the GAC is a woman. We don't have parity on the board, but we have a number of strong female voices on the board. Um, uh, the chair of the registry stakeholder group is a woman. Um, and, and as I say, I'm not discounting the perception, but I think it would be really interesting to drill down further on why that perception exists. Um, you know, is it that people are perceiving those particular roles as being merely tokenism? Um, I don't think that's the case. I know most of those people quite well, and I don't believe that's the case. I think they're, you know, they're very strong and, and they hold those posts in their own right. So, so what is it that's driving that perception that, that, that there is gender inequality? I think it would be interesting to also drill down in, into whether it's within specific groups that you're getting a much stronger feeling of that. So, you know, if it's within a group where where there are, you know, most of the participants are men, um, you know, is that what, you know, is there a stronger perception that women are excluded? Um, I, I, as I say, I'm not, I'm not discounting it. I, I totally agree that the perception exists. It's just, it would be interesting to try and understand why, when there are so many strong female role models, people are still perceiving that. Um, and perhaps then we could help try, you know, work out a, a better way to address it. But I have a, my own view, which is, perhaps that, that, that many people answering that survey have the encounter that, that all women have in all walks of life, not just in ICANN, which is that, that female voices are quite often drowned out in a group um, and that when, you know, when women become impassioned about something, it, it's viewed as emotional and, and you know, we, we are frequently discounted, but that's not an ICANN thing. 
Thank you very much, Susan. So, um, we have two concrete questions regarding the survey came from the floor. So, Susan is asking about the basis for this perception of uh, gender inequality and, and Lucevis was asking whether um, findings from the board survey turned to be um, same views shared by everyone or uh, if there are discrepancy. Um, uh, Jan, would you like to comment on this now, or shall we go to the speakers and, and start our second round first? Maybe I could give brief responses to several specific questions and then some of the general things save, uh, to save to the end. But uh, uh, the perceptions of the board, Lucevis, that you, you mentioned, that was well spotted, indeed, on the, on the graphs. Uh, the perceptions of the board of the problematic nature of the different equalities, inequalities is significantly lower on four of the five dimensions. So there's a, the board is on par with other constituencies when it comes to gender inequalities, but it's significant, perceiving significantly lower problem, problems in relation to age, language, uh, race and uh, region. So that might be something for the board to reflect upon. Um, the gender inequality, why it's perceived, of course this is probably beyond my pay grade, uh, but, the, but, this, uh, but I think you're right to say, and it touches on what Lucevis also asked about, what drives these perceptions? We've presented you with descriptive statistical patterns. We haven't explained them. So the explanations of people's perceptions may lie in institutional procedures and institutional outcomes. But as you yourself also mentioned, people bring in all kinds of baggage from their wider societal experiences and then that influences what they see in the institutional setting. And at that point it can be the wider societal experience rather than the institutional setting per se. We would have to look at that in more detail. I'm not saying that it is the reason, but it's a, it's a possibility for sure. Uh, I think that's the two main points that came up. Yeah, I now. think, yeah, that's it. So, uh, back to our speakers and if there are any um, specific proposals you see to advance uh, the issue of um, inclusiveness. Um, so, shall we start by you again? Okay. okay. And Zini, please, go ahead. I think that uh, after hearing the conversations in the floor and the remarks on multi-stakeholderism and multi-stakeholder governance model in general, I would like to call attention to the fact that though we may be discussing ICANN broadly in the study and the issues of uh, technical and operational matters of the internet, internet governance today has expanded to much more issues as the internet becomes increasingly socialized and there are more and more public policy matters that are implicated in this. And as was shared by someone from the floor and as has also been pointed out by the UN high level panel on digital cooperation, there's also a need to think about what we can do to make the internet governance forum like better or more effective, right? And because there is a lot of frustration among many people and for understanding reasons that there is a danger that the IGF gets reduced to a talk shop which does not lead to any binding outcomes and where do we go from here? So I just want to put on the table the fact that we can never like completely solve this question or address it in any meaningful way if we are not willing to revisit the whole idea of enhanced cooperation in the Tunis agenda and look at the fact that states at their respective have respective roles and responsibilities to play in terms of internet related public policy matters and there may be areas where the technical and operational matters intersect with these public policy matters for example the whole de debate on jurisdiction of uh, I can. So we need to think about that. And uh, my last point is this that though, you know, uh, there's the, like this whole fear of having a multilateral process around internet governance, in parallel we are seeing that certain portions of this agenda, like cross-border data flows governance, for example, are getting pushed through various trade agreements. OECD has a committee on digital economy policy. Now when you see that happening, then why is it that we have this fear that is only like around the multilateral process around internet governance? So shouldn't we 
be reflecting on that. Thank you very much, Nandini. Um, Erika, any uh, thoughts about how we can enhance inclusiveness? Yeah, I don't think so. It's actually very complicated. Um, I mean, we will have to accept to some degree some limitations. So we can't ignore the market players because, uh, but we have, to, so we have to accept limitations and we have to f accept facts and reality and the mission of ICANN. And we have to focus on the mission. <coughs> we can't get ourselves confused with everything what is happening in the internet ecosystem. I think it's extremely important to understand this. The second, but I believe uh, what we can do, we can introduce more facts. And, and I believe facts typically do help in shaping whatever one wants to do. Give me, give you one example. Um, if you, uh, if you, for example, let's take an example, the new round, if you want to do a new round. So we then will look at the advantages and disadvantages of the past uh, round. We will understand what worked globally, so where are market players which are well situated. We will understand uh, where are the disadvantages of the various TL, uh, TDL, uh, TLD models. And then we, we compare this to the new round. So what we then can do, we can say, okay, it's clear in, in, there was no take up on, on uh, GTLD in, uh, in Africa. There was none in, in particular other regions in uh, maybe India. There's nothing in Pakistan or very few. There's a lot on China. So and then we can do, try to understand why is this the case. And then we can see, is there a possibility and is it reasonable to do so to create markets in these particular regions. Maybe we come to the conclusion once this analysis is done, maybe it's not helpful, it, you know, it depends. But we don't have facts about this. We talk about it, about inclusiveness in, in you know, with regard to certain regions which are disadvantages. But what are we doing and what do we want to do actually? Um, you know, is it helpful to balance it? Is it helpful to artificially create a market? Or maybe it isn't, but we have to talk about it. And the same is true for gender. Once we have facts with regard to maybe a particular stakeholder group, where we see there's a clear, um, there's no, you know, no kind of fair balance or regional fair balance, then we have to talk about it. Do we want to change the situation? Can we change the situation? Because if there are not sufficient players from these regions, we can't even change this. Um, the same is true for language. Can we change it? Probably not. So we have to be fair to each other too, to un actually understand what we can really change and what we can't. A lot we can do through translation, but of course not in, in working group, much harder. Um, thank you very much, Erika. So, um, Leon, any thoughts on how to enhance inclusiveness? I mean, whether at ICANN or elsewhere, I'm, the discussion is open. Thank you very much, Manal. So, as I said, I think that this is a, a, an educational effort that we all must uh, undertake, right? Uh, one of the strategic objectives of uh, the uh, strategic plan for uh, ICANN that was adopted by the, by the board and the community is exactly to improve the effectiveness of ICANN's multi-stakeholder model of governance. And one, of way, one of the ways that we see this can be achieved is by increasing uh, needs of inclusivity, accountability and transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So we are working on this and we know that uh, we are far from having the perfect system, but we do actually, we, we actually do great efforts to do that. I mean, Lucibis was saying that she was uh, uh, someone that came from the outside and that she came right into the board, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you the same story. I, I, I came in as an outsider, but the difference is that I didn't came to the board, I came through the fellowship program. So I started at the very bottom of the pyramid uh, within the ICANN structure, and now I'm proud to say that I'm a board member and I'm the vice chair of the board. So. The system works, yeah. right? But you have to work as well. It's not going to work for you, right? So you you need to 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 pay attention, to make the effort, to uh, you know join 2 a.m. calls, 3 a.m. calls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and if you do it, 
you will actually achieve this meaningful and inclusive participation that you are looking for. So the tools are there. You need to take advantage of those tools. There are also some situations that fall outside ICANN's uh, uh, ability to level the ground for everyone. We are also aware of that. And, and yes, there are other fora that can uh, actually try to solve those problems. But the people coming to the different foras tend to be the same, right? We see each other at different fora and we, uh, we, we discuss the same issues on different perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, that is good because there is continuity to, to trying to solve the problems. But that is what I mean when I say that we also need to do outreach within our communities to pull in new people, to try to level the ground for those who are also interested in joining the different efforts that are carried out in different fora to join us and to say, okay, let's sit at the table, let's look at common uh, solutions and let's see how we can better implement those solutions so, so that the multi-stakeholder model is actually enhanced, it is improved and it, is, it, it continues to evolve in a way that actually serves the purpose for which it was thought of uh, to begin with. So, Thank you, Manal. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, so, again, back to our audience and if there are any reactions to reflections made by uh, the panel or if you have your own suggestions as well, again, whether for ICANN or uh, elsewhere. So, Makeli, please. Uh, thanks, Manal. Um, Makeli from Black Knight, long time um, ICANN addict. I think I need a new hobby. Um, now I, think, I think this discussion is very interesting and important, but I think also people need to have a little bit of a reality check. I mean, ICANN's mission is quite narrow in scope. So that means that by, by the very nature of the scope of ICANN, not every single human being on the planet needs to turn up. Now that doesn't mean that, they, that, their, that their views their perspective cannot be brought to the table, and that's why you have the various stakeholder groups, constituencies, trade associations, and others who do turn up. But I think we have to be careful about how we frame this inclusion, because if you have, I mean, we have expressions in English like, you know, many, many cooks spoil the broth. I mean, if you have 500 people in a working group, you're never, ever going to get anything done and you'll still be, you'll be circling the drain on the same topic forever. It'll just drive you crazy. And one of the criticisms of how ICANN works at times is how slow decision-making processes can be. That in many times, I mean, I ICANN is not an agile organization. I mean, if you're coming at things from a, from a business perspective, engaging within an ICANN process is a surefire way of Running, running your budget up to, the, up to the limit and never actually getting that product out the door. So I think you have to be careful there. So we, one of the things I think somebody touched on, I think it might have been Jorge, was the PDP 3.0 uh, thing that's going on within the GNSO. So it's a GNSO council driven um, project. I sit on the GNSO council at the moment where I represent uh, the registrars. And the idea behind that is to rejig how the working groups are, function, how they're made up, so they could be more effective. If that does not mean that we are excluding, it just means that we're trying to make them that little bit more functional, agile, and actually get to a result. Because I think if we fail to do that, it doesn't matter how inclusive you are, if you're, because we're actually failing everybody. Um, and I think Martin was also touched on something which I think is very important, which is around how that participation can work. I mean, if you look at IETF, you look at RIPE, you look at other areas where there are discussions and there are policy development processes, most of it's done electronically. It's done via email. Uh, some, some organizations are using other technologies that might make Lucivis happier, such as um, Slack or a variety of other technologies. And that works really, really well. Whereas within the ICANN space, a lot of the time, people feel that they have to turn up physically at meetings and sit across tables and yell at each other, which I don't think is particularly helpful. I think there needs to be a better kind of way of doing a lot of that because 
it doesn't make any sense. I mean, whether it's the carbon footprint or just the logistical issues that you're facing. I mean, you look at the ICANN budget, what is money being spent on? Organizing meetings. I mean, I, it's not actually product or improving anything for anybody. It's just organizing meetings in different parts of the world, which probably isn't a particularly good use of money. There's probably better things that could be, that, that could be spent on. I mean, you could look at, you know, improving capacity of the root server network in certain parts of the world. That will cost money, but no, the money has to go to having these bloody meetings. So I think this, I think this is a worthwhile um, conversation. I think some, there's some very good points and that study is very helpful. Uh, the issues around language, it's not just a global south versus global north. Uh, within Europe, I see it with um, the non-English speakers. They are not comfortable a lot of the time speaking. I mean, if you come into ICANN, you're dealing with a lot of well-educated, very articulate, and qu quite often aggressive lawyers and others. So coming into that, if, if English is not your first language, can be quite intimidating. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Michaeli, and very good points. Um, any other comments or remarks? Yes, Jorge, please, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Mana. So if nobody else takes the floor, I'll take it a, a second time. Um, I think this is an ongoing uh, discussion. Um, I think that there are many things that are being done. Uh, I'm the, the last one to, to deny that. But uh, my point is we have to do more. And uh, I think one precondition to participate in discussions is, for instance, to have accessible, neutral, objective information of what is going on. And uh, sometimes it's so difficult, not that uh, anybody is biasing the information, but the information, the, the quality is not enough, it's not understandable, it's not user-friendly. And uh, for instance, in my country, in Switzerland, we have every, every three months, we have referenda, at the local, at the regional, and at the federal level on issues which are much more important and much more complicated than ICANN discussions. And they manage the people who prep, uh, prepare the booklets of information for those uh, referenda, which is uh, one of the cornerstones of the direct de uh, democracy in Switzerland. They manage to prepare those objective, neutral, informative uh, pieces of, uh, of information on what is the issue, what are the positions, what are the drawbacks, and so on and so forth. Why cannot we do that at the same level in, in ICANN? Then, uh, as Michele said, uh, we have to find the way of, uh, sorry, of combining the openness of uh, working groups, which is uh, good in itself because it uh, strengthens uh, transparency and it avoids monopolization by the few uh, with uh, a balanced composition of those working groups. And we can have different layers of participants, members of working groups and participants as we had in some experiences and that would also allow us to to have a balanced participation between the different stakeholder groups. And when we go to decision making, it would allow us to, to look, okay, what are the members saying from the different uh, stakeholder groups? What is the level of consensus? Because otherwise, in an open group with uh, 200 people, and that happens, maybe 180 agree with a certain position, but they all come from a certain region, a certain stakeholder group, a certain <laughs> background. And that's not uh, what we should going for. Uh, also, uh, this comes from my discussion on this other policy network. Uh, let's try to be creative and create ex additional layers of uh, interactive and accessible participation, perhaps with translation or with uh, better information 
so that people are really able to have a say, have a fair say before decisions are taken. Because uh, now, uh, normally, this information, you get it when it's too late, when uh, decisions were already taken, or at the beginning, not at the right moment of time. And I, I think we, we can be creative on that. And of course, we have to self-organize. I think uh, Leon is right. Uh, you as a person can do, and you can try, and you can succeed. It depends on many things. But uh, also those who represent, and I include myself, diffuse interests, general interests. And uh, for those who know Mankur Olson, this should ring, uh, ring a bell. It's much more difficult to organize diffuse and general interests than direct interests. For those who represent such general interests, we have to self-organize. And uh, this is an ongoing discussion within the GAC. We are trying to break our heads and uh, uh, get uh, something out of our brains to, to see how we can make the GAC more efficient in being able in participating in these uh, policy development processes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Jorge. Paul, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just very quickly, uh, I, I, I like the conversation. And I, I think everyone agrees that inclusion and multi-stakeholders is important. And I think we understand it's not easy. And I think ICANN does need to identify what form of multi-stakeholderism or inclusion works for it, because there's not a one-fit-all. And you know, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm just encouraged that this conversation is actually happening. And I believe multi-stakeholderism is good, but I think I can just has to identify what will work for it to, to help it achieve its mission, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So, last call for comments or remarks. Yes, Susan, please go ahead. Susan Anthony, uh, very active participant both within ICANN and IGF. But I want to go back to something Michele had said moments ago uh, about uh, should we have all these meetings uh, and is there a better form? So my question is one for certainly another day. Um, over the years, I've, I've suffered the, the uh, overload of emails and uh, I also appreciate that coming to meetings is a luxury for many, many people in the world. Um, so I'm wondering if there are some other modalities that should be used in addition to or instead of face-to-face -face meetings that can also meet all of these goals that we've talked about over the past couple of hours. Um, I happen to like the face-to-face. -face. Um, I work with um, people who feel that face-to-face -face is essential, certain cultures in, in my country, the United States, that face-to-face -face is essential. Uh, you must see the person, you must see them in the eye. I don't know whether um, uh, webcams, etc., are good substitutes. I tend to think not, but this is an issue that I hope we will look at going forward. Thank you very much, Susan. And yeah, emails seem to be <laughs> haunting everyone. I was just saying that I started to appreciate spam <laughs> because <laughs> I just get to delete those without even worrying. But <laughs> jokes aside, uh, Jan, you want to say anything before we wrap up? Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Well, th th first of all, to say thank you, everyone, panel participants, everyone for the, for the, for the comments. I'm really glad to see you. Uh, discussion going that can keep going from here. Um, selfishly, I'm very grateful for the feedback because you've put it on, you've probably seen me scribbling along and uh, taking down many notes that uh, we can take in on our analysis further. Just underline again, we looked at ICANN as a case study, uh, not because ICANN was seen as particularly problematic, but because it's a very open and receptive uh, uh, arena where people are very concerned about the number of issues and very ready and willing to share their views. So we've been able to get some remarkable data, I think, as you've as you've seen in terms of people's perceptions of the situation, and that's really uh, helpful. One thing that we played around with, Hortense and I, just to underline some of these issues, we looked through the 467 people who responded to the, to the, to the questionnaire, and as I said before, they are a representative sample. We're statistically quite, quite 
almost 100% convinced of that. And we, we put into the, uh, into the formula, we said, okay, pick us out all of the older male white English North people. And in the sample of 467, 120 fit that matrix. And then we asked, tell us how many younger female, less English fluent South of color, and it yielded four. Anyway, so that's just, that's, a, that's an interesting, we've mainly been talking about perceptions, but this, was, this is a, an objective uh, indicator, if you like. So that, that's something to think about. Um, that said, inclusivity is not the only principle for judging, as I think Michael uh, uh, pointed out. And we asked people about a number of other issues and said, what are, what are your important principles for judging how your, your confidence in ICANN? And uh, inclusivity was one of the 12 that we looked at, and it tended to be towards the, the upper end, but things like rep, you know, efficient decision making and transparency and so on were also regarded as very important. So you have to trade these things off uh, with, with one another. Um, Manal, I really liked your opening remark that said about different perceptions can make resolutions of a problem more difficult. Um, I hope that with this data, we've shown you that there are some different perceptions around. Um, and if that helps to make people more aware of how they're seeing the, the problem more differently, maybe that can help in a small way to get more mutual understanding. So if we get that from this, uh, this, uh, this study and work, then I'll be very, very happy. Um, if you want to have a, a copy of the study, send it to me. If you drop me one of your cards on the way out, then I'll make sure that you get the hard copy of, or the, the actual full text. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, any final remarks from our panelists? You're no. good. Yep. Okay, then um, it's, yeah, this is definitely the start of the discussion and uh, it's again an open question, how inclusive can we be or when exactly do we say now we are inclusive? I mean, this is an open question. So with this, I would like to thank our uh, panelists here, Nandini, uh, Erika, and, and Leon. Thank you very much, Jan, as well, and Hortness, for uh, this excellent uh, and thorough report and interesting findings. And thanks each and every one of you for the interactive discussion. Thank you. Thank you, too.